Roman walked out of the jewelry store, smiling contentedly. He had just bought his favorite wife, Ginger, beautiful gold earrings, just the kind she had wanted for a long time. Roman imagined how happy his wife would be with this gift, how the girl would throw herself around his neck, hug and kiss him, dangling her feet in delight. Roman loved such moments, it seemed to him that it was in such emotions that their love was shown. And he knew for a fact that Ginger appreciated it too. They had been living together for almost seven years and had never been able to fully enjoy each other. Roman pampered his wife, often gave her flowers and gifts, and on the last birthday and it all presented a brand new car. Of course, Roman was not an oligarch and in order to please Ginger, he had to work hard and often absent from home, spending most of the time in business trips. But it was worth it. Beautiful Ginger was everything to him, to some extent she even replaced a child for him. At least, it seemed so to him. Several times Roman brought up the fact that he wanted children, but in response to this his wife capriciously stretched out her lips. I'm not ready to be a mom yet. I want you to spoil only me alone. I love the way you take care of me. And it would be sad if I had to share your attention with someone else. Well, just imagine, children, a constant screaming, constant illness, tired, dissatisfied wife who cannot sleep. Is that what you want to see me like? We could hire a nanny. She could help you. Roman, honey, let's talk about this later. After all, what's the hurry? I want to live a little longer for myself. Roman agreed with Ginger and waited patiently for the time when she wanted them to have a baby. In the meantime, he continued to please his wife with various signs of attention, as she deserved. Roman took out his phone and dialed Ginger's number, he suddenly wanted to talk to her, to tell her that in a couple of days he would be free and would be home on Friday. But her number was unavailable. He tried to call again, but it didn't work. Ginger often forgot to put her phone on the charger, could just put it somewhere and only remembered it when she needed it. Surely, in the evening, when she saw the missed calls from her husband, she would call and apologize, explaining her inattention. But as soon as Roman slipped the phone into his pocket, it rang with a loud ringtone. Roman smiled, thinking it was his wife calling, but the incoming number was unknown to him. Hello, he answered the persistent call. Roman? An unfamiliar voice asked him. Yes, it's me. To whom do I have the honor? My name is Peter. I'm calling you from the hospital where your wife has just been taken. She was in a car accident. Another woman died with her. Their cars collided at full speed. It was a head-on collision. Roman looked at the white fingers clutching the phone as if they wanted to crush it. I don't understand, he finally said. What did you say? Who died? Your wife, Ginger. Can you come over now? No, Roman said quietly, then suddenly hurried away. I'm away on a business trip. But I'll be there. I'm going to get a ticket right now. I'll be in time. I'll definitely be in time. Roman, there's nothing you can do. Try to pull yourself together. And please don't drive like that. And Ginger. Roman asked after a little silence. Where is she now? In the hospital. Your wife is in the morgue. She'll stay there until you arrive. Roman didn't ask anything else, he hurried to disconnect the call, because he felt a heavy lump in his throat. A muffled sob burst from his chest, Ginger was dead, his love, his precious sunshine would never meet him again, never smile, never hug him. Roman sank to the floor, wrapped his arms around his head and did not cry, but howled, bitterly and long, like a mortally wounded animal. Only two days later he managed to fly to his city. Friends and relatives, with whom he had called in advance, had already prepared almost everything he needed for the funeral. Roman did not even go home to change clothes, he went straight to the city morgue, where his cousin Andrew and closest friend Victor were waiting for him. They had all the necessary documents in their hands, and they showed them to the morgue employee. He took the papers and disappeared behind the door. Five minutes, fifteen, half an hour passed, 
but no one came out to them. Other people received the bodies of dead relatives without any problems, but Roman kept stomping at the huge, iron-clad door, not understanding the reasons for the delay. Finally, he couldn't stand it any longer and went inside the building, and there he attacked the first man he saw, demanding to give him his wife's body. Victor and Andrew, who stood behind Roman, made it clear that they were not going to wait any longer and that silly jokes were inappropriate in such a place. The man Roman had yelled at promised to look into the matter. And again, the long minutes of waiting dragged on. Finally, the pathologist himself came out to the grief-stricken husband and his friends. Roman, I don't know how this could happen, but your wife's body is not in our morgue. What are you saying? Victor began to be indignant, as Roman was simply speechless. Ginger died in a car accident, we have a death certificate, all the documents are in hand. What right do you have not to hand over the body? Wait, I'm not saying I don't want to give it back, the doctor hastened to justify himself. I'm saying that there is no body. Most likely, it has already been taken. By who? When? Where? Roman shouted, feeling like he was about to faint. He hadn't slept for the second 24 hours, exhausted by the misfortune and the long journey. And now this news. I don't understand anything myself, the doctor said. We have already checked everything twice. There is an entry in the register, your wife's body was indeed brought to us the day before yesterday. But where it went, we don't know. Roman's eyes were blurry and he would have fallen down if it hadn't been for the hands of his friends who picked him up. They sat him down on a bench, gave him a drink of cold water, and then they thought for a long time about what they should do now. First of all, they had to cancel the funeral. Relatives and friends of Roman and Ginger were shocked by what had happened, but the unhappy husband could not explain anything to anyone. He himself did not understand anything. All the more so because there was a long trial to come, which, however, did not yield any results. Ginger's body disappeared. The most unbelievable rumors began to spread through the city. They grew and multiplied, driving Roman crazy. Some said that a strange gang had appeared in the city, stealing bodies. Others assured that it was the work of negligent doctors who gave the bodies for organs to be sent abroad. Still others said that there had been no accident, and that Ginger had set it all up and had simply run away from her husband. Roman was not himself and had no idea who to believe and who not to believe. At some point he even began to think that his wife was actually alive, just some misunderstanding. Couldn't it have happened that she woke up in the morgue and just left there? But after the accident, she lost her memory and so now she can't go home. Inspired by this thought, Roman endlessly called hospitals, visited all the homeless shelters that were in the area, interviewed beggars and homeless people. He put up posters everywhere with Ginger's picture and a reward if anyone found his wife. Then one day he got a call from a woman he didn't know saying she knew where Ginger was. Is she alive? Is she alive? Roman shouted, unable to contain his emotions. The stranger waited until he calmed down and said quietly. Let's talk when we meet. It will be a hard and unpleasant conversation. Where can we meet you? Roman muttered, a little lost from such a statement. But then he pulled himself together. Look, come to my house, that would be best. We won't be disturbed here. All right, the woman agreed. Give me your address, and if you don't mind, I'll come right over. Wait, please. Just one word, is Ginger alive? No. She's dead, and another man buried her. But let me tell you all about it when I see you. Not half an hour later, Roman opened the door for her, looking with interest at a still young woman who could hardly have been thirty. My name is Kate, she said, and after a moment's silence, she added. I saw your advertisement for your wife. I decided to call you. You agreed to meet. So I came to tell you the truth. Unfortunately, I have very little time, I have a small child waiting for me, so let's start talking right away. Roman went into the living room and offered his guest a seat. She took his offer and sat down on a chair. 
Roman himself sat down on the sofa. I'll get straight to the point. Your wife's body was taken from the morgue by an acquaintance of mine, Kate began. His name is Pavel. Who is he? And why did he do it? Roman jumped up, unable to help himself. He and your ginger were lovers. They'd been seeing each other for over two years. And all that time neither you nor Mary, Pavel's wife and my friend, knew it. They saw each other often, went on vacations together. While you worked and Mary did the housework, Paul and Ginger had a lot of fun. But one day Mary found out, and then tragedy struck. Mary and Ginger were killed in the same accident. And it was probably Mary's fault. She wanted to get back at your wife for Paul, whom she loved very much. What are you talking about? Roman exclaimed. My wife never cheated on me. It's not true, and if Ginger really is dead, you can't defame her memory. Kate sighed and pulled some photographs out of her purse. Here, these are the very pictures that Ginger brought back to Mary and gave as proof of her love for Paul. You see, they are on vacation at the sea, here somewhere else, and this is your apartment, do you recognize it? Your wife didn't hesitate to take a lover right here. I'm sorry, my words are cruel, but it's true and you should know about it. I don't know what her plans were for you, but Mary was in the way. Ginger didn't want to share Paul with anyone. With trembling hands, Roman thumbed through the pictures of his naked wife enjoying herself in the arms of a man he didn't know. A heavy sigh escaped his chest. I can't believe this. Yes, Kate nodded. It's really hard to learn that about someone you care about. But maybe it would be easier for you if you knew the truth about her. Why did this Pavel take her body? Roman asked after some silence. He wanted to bury it himself. He must have loved her, I can't tell you. Then I'll ask him myself. Right after Mary and Ginger's funeral, Pavel left this area for good. Where he went, I don't know. He has no relatives here. It's a big country. And what's the point of looking for him? Why? What's in it for you? How do you know Pavel buried Ginger? I saw her grave with my own eyes when I went to see Mary the morning after the funeral. There was nothing there the night before, but early in the morning, the grave was there. There's only three people in the village who dig graves. I bought them alcohol and a good snack, and they told me that some weirdo had buried his wife here in the middle of the night. Said he wanted to save money on the funeral. But he paid the laborers generously. That's how your wife's grave got there. The plaque says Ginger's name, date of birth and date of death. Ginger's a rare name. And I remembered very well that Mary had told me that Paul had a mistress named Ginger. She herself had come to Mary's house to tell her the whole truth. Ginger thought Mary would take the baby and leave, thus freeing Paul. But she didn't know my friend very well. Mary loved her husband too much to just leave him. So, she decided to get revenge. You know, minutes before she died, Mary called me and asked me not to leave her son, Michael. And then all of a sudden, she started crying and saying, Goodbye, to me. Mary, Mary, I yelled into the phone. Stop, what are you doing? Mary, wake up. But she didn't hear me. Her last words were, it's her. Ginger. The next second, I heard the sound of a terrible bang and the scraping of metal. That was it. Kate was silent for a long time, as if she was reliving those terrible moments again, and Roman was silent too, not knowing how to react to what he had just learned. I still can't believe it's true, he said finally. Neither can I, Kate sighed. Mary and I were very close, raised in the same orphanage. And when Michael was born, I became his godmother. They also have a child. Roman sighed. Yes, he lives with me now. Why with you? Didn't Pavel take him with him? No, he never recognized Michael. But why? Roman wondered. It's a long story. Pavel was in business, and he'd failed at something. 
Mary agreed to become a surrogate mother to help her husband with money. He talked her into it. It worked out, and Paul's business took off again. Except that the couple for whom Mary carried the child barely looked at the boy who was born, as they refused to give him up. You see, he didn't look like them at all. Mary was offered to give him to an orphanage, but she knew all too well what it was like to be raised in such a place. So she insisted that the boy stay with her. She had counted on Paul to treat him as his own, but he had never accepted his presence. Roman clutched his head with his hands. I'm going crazy with all this. Okay, Kate, let me walk you out. I need to be alone. Wait, let me get the money. You told me all this to get a reward. No, Kate shook her head, I just didn't want you to suffer for nothing. Ginger wasn't worthy of you. I'm sorry to tell you that. And I don't want your money. Goodbye. Wait a minute, but you can't do that. I promise to pay you. You didn't promise me anything, Roman. And I'm sorry for barging in like this and disturbing your soul. Have a nice day. Kate left, and Roman stood in the middle of the hallway for a long moment, staring at the door as it closed behind her. Then memories came flooding back to him. Here was Ginger talking about how she dreamed of going to the sea, and he excused himself by saying that he couldn't take a vacation right now. She got upset, cried like a little hurt girl and his heart instantly melted, he couldn't stand her tears. And then he began to persuade her to go on vacation alone. He ordered a room in a good boarding house, bought tickets, paid for everything. Ginger was happy as a baby. But in fact, she laughed at him, knowing that she would not go there alone, but with this Paul. When he called her, she often didn't pick up the phone and then excused herself for her inattention. And now it was clear to him, at this time, she was having fun with another man's husband and did not want to be disturbed. And the children. She didn't want children because she didn't know who could get her pregnant. Or maybe it was just that a child could prevent her from enjoying the life that two men were providing for her at once. Roman walked to the kitchen and grabbed a large garbage bag and began throwing Ginger's pictures and all of her favorite things that filled his apartment into it. After an hour, he took everything out to the vacant lot and lit a big bonfire there, and then he sat for a long time watching the past life and the love he had so carefully kept in his heart burn in its flames. Three months passed. All this time Roman's friends did not leave him alone, supported him and tried in every possible way to distract him from heavy thoughts. In addition, he was completely immersed in work and almost never at home, because the empty walls of the apartment pressed on him. And then one morning Roman woke up with the thought that he should try to start over. To try to build a new relationship, to start a real family, to plunge into the care of her. So, he decided to find Kate. This woman had been on his mind for some time. He liked her honesty and openness, as well as seriousness and kindness. She'd taken in her friend's son without a second thought, and it was the kind of thing. Not everyone dares to do. Roman made inquiries, found out where Kate lived and drove to her house. To his surprise, she came out to meet him with bags in her hands. Next to her was a little boy with huge trusting eyes. Kate, hello, Roman said, getting out of the car. Are you leaving? Well, you could say that, Kate replied tiredly, saying hello to Roman. For some reason she wasn't surprised to see him and treated him so calmly, as if they had never had that strange conversation and were good friends who had parted only yesterday and were seeing each other again today. How so? Roman asked. I used to rent this house, and now the owners are back, and Michael and I have to find a new place to live. I sold my apartment to help Mary with money. I even lived with her and Paul for a while. I told you, Mary and I were like sisters, we spared nothing for each other. And Michael's house? Or rather, his mother, Mary. Pavel sold it a long time ago. What a bastard! Roman exclaimed, and then approached the boy. Well, brother, let's get acquainted? My name is Roma. Come on, nodded Michael. Only there are no such brothers. You are very big. All right. 
then let me be your daddy. Would that be okay, with you? I do, he smiled. Then he looked at Kate. Mommy Kate, can Roma be my daddy? He's good, I know. Kate looked at Roman with tears in her eyes. What can I say? Roman exclaimed and got them into the car, loading their belongings into the trunk. Where are we going? Kate asked. Home, Roman answered. And no objections would be accepted. A year passed. Returning from a business trip, Roman bought flowers for his wife Kate, a large construction set for his son Michael, and some rattles for his little daughter Alice, whom Kate had given him. His extended family was looking forward to seeing him, and he knew it for sure, and so he was truly happy. Only now he realized that true family happiness was when you were loved and waited for, not deceived at every turn.